Oh uh, my uh, goodness, OMG, it's 2024, and this is a brand new episode of Because Cannabis every single Wednesday, 4.20 p.m. on YouTube, every Thursday on Spotify with video and anywhere that you listen to your podcast audio-wise. My name is BC Wayman, Dustin Kava here as always, back again, back again. It's a brand new year, Dustin Kava. We are well over 100 episodes, Dustin Kava. <sighs> I'm excited for what 2024 is going to do. 2023 didn't turn out exactly as planned, but I got to tell you, ended well for the show, Dustin, and I am very excited for what we're about to do this year. How you feeling uh, as we kick off the 2024 year, Dustin Kava? Ooh, that's a heavy-handed, heavy-loaded question. I think it feels, uh, I gotta be honest, it doesn't feel heavy. It feels pretty light. Like you could be like, hey, what's up, head knob? But you're gonna go serious. You're gonna drop some emotional <laughs> drama upon us all. Lay it out. I just I I think that this is gonna be a different the year than we're used to. I think that people are tired of stagnation. And I think that there's going to be some big pushes for both individual growth and growth of other goals company wide. So I I think that there's going to be a little bit less playing it safe with your people, with people. It is going to be interesting. New Year's are fun. Are you a person who likes like a, an anniversary of sorts, a Monday or a new day, a new morning time even, or a new year that you can uh, figuratively, proverbially, easy for me to say, peel back the edge or cut anew and say, I can begin afresh because of a symbolism associated with a date or a time? Is that something that you can mentally kind of trick yourself into and find yourself succeeding because you use that symbolic date or time, or do you just become a man of action whenever is necessary? Kung Fu grip and all. God, I'm such a man of conflict. I have, <laughs> I, I, I don't fucking know, man. I, okay. If you were to ask my, my girl, she would say that I am very, uh, you know, if we argue at night, when I wake up in the morning, I'm a new day type of person, but I think, fucking hate anniversaries i hate i fuck i don't i don't like i don't like this like get me a present because it's this fucking day type of shit so and i'm certainly not like a new year's resolution guy i think you're just setting yourself up to kick yourself in the balls by failing so no no you haven't like, made something you haven't got your planet fitness membership going you haven't started <laughs> a book of the month club because you're gonna read a 12 no, books this I, calendar year you don't have a goal set I just forth? i pick any day i say Thursday of fucking the 19th of February is my day. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not like a, it's a January 1st. So I need that new goal. New me. I can't believe goal. we're friends. I got to be honest with you. This is really, I'm a little hurt. <laughs> always, I'm a little dismayed to learn this yeah. about you right now. I am all about it. I'm <laughs> all up in that symbolism uh, is a day is, and maybe you can listen. If you're listening right now and you can relate, definitely hit that subscribe button. So you can hear more stories of us kvetching about our lives and such. Uh, <laughs> when you are feeling like you're not accomplishing everything you want to do, you need like to constantly reset the goalposts. I need to always move them forward because then I cannot feel like I'm not succeeding. I cannot feel like I'm failing at what I'm doing. I can feel like I'm just not quite. Yeah, there but would yet. you fucking wait from like say you're in March or June and you've didn't and you needed a new goal set? It's not like you're gonna wait to the first of the year to initiate that, right? You're not like New Year's is the day I need like I it's uh the first of the year first or do you just like you know you you move the goal post as you accomplish things or as things become less obtainable or something you know like you move I, I i'm not the type to like wait till a certain day you know i'm like it's two weeks from now i'm fucking doing it whatever two weeks from now is going to be i'm that's my day well let us know how you are put something in the comments below are you a new year's resolution kind of person are you someone who is more like dustin do you tend to go team bc or Tim, Team Dustin, that's what we're going to eventually just pit ourselves against each other. We got a fun show today, Dustin. As much as you may not like predictions and resolutions, we are going to talk about what's going to happen this year in the cannabis industry. There's been a lot that happened in 2023. Obviously, we've had a lot of great shows. Be sure to check them out if you visit the channel, YouTube, at Because Cannabis, a slew of shows talking about issue two. Uh, some entrepreneurial guides with Andrew D'Angelo, new episode coming soon. Lots of great stuff on there for you to talk about and learn 
what happened in 2023. But I got to tell you, and we'll look here in just a second, Dustin, at some of the predictions that were made in 2023 to see if they actually came forth in 2024. But I think um, it's going to be a good year. I think it's been a good year. Uh, but I think, Dustin, you and I, we hit the old uh, hit the old bong, I suppose, and came up with some fresh, hot takes of what we think is going to happen in the new year, of what we think is going to happen in 2024. But we are but two humble men, Dustin Kava. So we thought if we're going to do a show right, if we're going to kick off 2024 in style, uh, let's bring friend to the show, maybe uh, currently the most frequent guest of the show thus far, Anthony Trav, Trav Media Group. Uh, welcome to the show, Anthony. How you doing today, man? I'm doing awesome, but my camera just went down while I was sitting in the lobby, and I'm kind of disappointed. It froze here on the, the cameo, so I feel bad that I've had to downgrade now to the camera. You do look like you got a fuzzy sheen. Show. Between the time that we first met and what we are now. It's all right. Oh We're not gosh. on YouTube. We didn't just get like 13,000 people watching our oh, leafy man. video. We didn't just have Jim freaking Belushi on <laughs> the air. Check out those episodes, please. Uh, well, let's see if I can fix this live real quick. First. We can fix it live. We're uh, let's see we're, if I can fix it live. That's what I do. Low key, as live. the kids cake kind of show. New vote, new resolution in 2024. Good video Wait a technology. Minute. Oh, we're back. Anthony Trav. We should. A lot back. is happening. Uh oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, we're back. We're back. They don't call him the best marketing guy in the business for <laughs> nothing. Look at that. That just happens blurry... so I can prove how good I am with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anthony Trav, Trav Media Group. Um, are you a New Year's resolution person, Anthony? Um, I am. I feel like I'm lagging. I hate to keep talking about the camera, but I need to switch back. I can't do this show without the proper tools. No, you got to go for it. All right. We'll you get you there. We're we'll here. let Anthony switch back. Yeah, all you're all good. Viewers, Once Anthony let me jump back, back to his in. Camera. Now I'm here. Let's just let's just do it this way. I I am a New Year's resolution guy, but I believe in. Um, I look at it as more of a measurement point. Like I think from business, you look at quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. So it's not like I I, I agree with some of Dustin's thoughts of, um, you know, using it to using it as an excuse to set a goal and to start something isn't a good thing. But I think for me, it's about a looking back on 2023 and seeing where I could have done better and how things could have gone better. Um, but I also think it's, you know, a way to start the new goals for this year, but you gotta, you gotta follow through. It's just a day, just like any other day. Uh, I gotta, I, I have to call it out here, uh, Anthony. So we have, you know, behind the wall, we have Anthony, we're sitting in, we're getting before the show. We have our coffee. Everyone's got their like coffee mugs. I'm drinking in there. Um, I don't know. Uh, Anthony, uh, can you read, can you read? I got bad eyes. Can you read what's on your uh, coffee mug right now for the okay, audience? Well, it says Hocus Pocus. I don't remember what it says. Hocus Pocus. I need coffee to focus. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> sounds. I got to tell you, uh, Anthony Trav, uh, either you have a very eclectic collection of coffee mugs or it sounds like my mom's collection of coffee <laughs> mugs. It sounds like something I, like my mom is 70 and I didn't know. I don't know what to get my mom for like Christmas and things. You know what I got her this year? I got her a coffee mug with the word mom on it. That's what I flat out. I got, I got a couple other things, but I got a coffee mug with the word mom on it. And it was, if we're going to just totally uh, do this, the first year that the Wayman family exchanged a cannabis presents uh, for Christmas. Thank you, Top of the Oh, show. yeah. Man. Given the gift of weed at the holiday season in the Wayman household, that's how we're rolling in 2024. Uh, that is a very mom like mug, Anthony. I just got to sure. tell you it's, that. It's def I do have an eclectic collection of coffee mugs, but this one does go credit to my mom. I'm actually sitting in my. Um, former room when I lived at my mom's because I picked them all up from the airport. They just got back from seeing my brother for Orlando and we were recording now and it was, didn't have time to make it back. So here we are and got, got my little basement set up, but this one definitely, <laughs> definitely is a dedication for sure. This is where it all I began in a weird way. So starting the year, the where Anthony began, story, you two were down there just dreaming of marketing dreams in the basement. This is where all the bad, <laughs> This is where all the dreams that didn't happen happened that led me to then having a realistic dream to then move forward. <laughs> I actually have right next to me on this door. Um, I play music and our me original metal band scribed out all our original songs right here. And there's still like very deeply etched chalk here where you can <laughs> see like, you know, different names and stuff. So it, it is a uh, it is fun to see those things that, you know, you don't think about at the time. Uh, well, I, that actually brings me into what I really want to talk about, which is what the hell do you actually think is going to happen this year? 
That's a big bold topic, right? That's a big bold topic. Let's do this. We're going to talk 2024 predictions, but it is, uh, you know, interesting to see what other people are thinking out there. I know that we have some of our own. Let's do, before we get started, Dustin, I'm going to bring up this on screen right now. So I went through and looked through some predictions on what some folks said would happen in 2023. And so I just want to see like right now how far like close or off some of these places are. We're on, you know, a couple of different websites here. Some industry, uh, you know, leaders kind of looking at their predictions of what would happen last year. What would happen in 2023? Uh, and first off, they start with the top five states to regulate uh, cannabis and adult use in 2023. And you know which state was not on there? You know which state that I did not see in any of the other uh, sections about doing that? was what's going to happen in 2024 or what's going to happen in Ohio. Not one of them picked out Ohio as a potential <laughs> state to go see adult use, yet a lot of people are predicting it to be big in 2024. When the year started, either one of you, when the year started, we'll stop the screen share, we'll come back to it. When the year started uh, last year in 2023, did either one of you think that by the end of the year, Ohio would have adult use cannabis? No. I no. didn't. I'll it, be bluntly it, honest too. I, I had a I had a lot of family things going on in 2023, but I was actually shocked coming closer to the election that it was even up for election. Like it kind of hit me, but because every year it's the same process of like filling out as many ballots as you can and like praying and hoping that it makes it there. And it was praying, like hoping, almost, signing I and hoping. hoping. Yeah, and, I, and I'm super happy it did. Um, you know, I'm happy with how the law is right now. I mean, it's super early on, but I think I'm on camera on at least six shows saying no, no way, no way. It's, it's a big fallacy. It's never happening. In oh Ohio. yeah. I bet you we could probably do a super clip cut, like a super cut of all of our going through and talking about how many different times, uh, Ohio did not work out for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then here it is. I did not, when I the know. year started, I did not, uh, think it was going to happen at all. Like I didn't see it coming. I don't think a lot of people saw it coming. I think they're predicting Ohio to be a huge marketplace um, for that. But we'll get back to some of those states. So let's start there. Uh, I think that's a big kind of question as we get ready to go into issue two. I just read uh, an article. They're talking a lot of people are hoping for, you know, within the first year or two, you know, easily uh, hundreds of million of revenue, which is equating to a fairly decent amount, you know, tens of millions of tax revenue. Uh, out the gate, right? I think they're predicting huge sales, uh, exponential customer base. There's about 180,000 people on a regular basis, give or take a few thousand that purchase medicinal cannabis. Currently today, there's like 400,000 people registered, but there's only about 180,000 active and they have estimations. I have seen these estimations that by the end of this year, they suspect that we will have almost uh, two or three times that marketplace and on a daily average basis, like four or 500,000, maybe even pushing a million. There's 11 million people in the state of Ohio, give or take <laughs> a few hundred thousand, pushing a million people regularly purchasing cannabis in Ohio. So let's start with that number. If you know right now today, six years, four years in, four years in since sales, six years in since the program started medicinally. Ohio has um, about 180,000 active patients. We know that Michigan does roughly 20% of Ohio licenses, give or take 15, 20, depending on where you read. Uh, what do you think customer base Ohio is going to have? Are we going to have a million people in a year? Is it going to grow only a little bit? What do you guys think? I think, honestly, the there's going to be a massive influx the first four months of people like, hell yeah, I want to go into a shop and buy some stuff. And then I think like, as with everything, uh, we'll definitely decrease that by 35%. Wow. Yeah, it's cool. Good. No, I was gonna say 35 is a huge number. I was curious what you had to say, Anthony. I, I don't have like a percentage like that, but I'm, there's a couple factors I want, I want to see play out first, which is like pricing. Um, you know, cause even here on the black market, or if you go up to our, our Northern state, Michigan, it's like the prices are very low. So it's like, I don't know. I think, again, there's that awe of going to a dispensary here in Ohio that a lot of people will do. But as far as your average average day-to-day -day consumer, you know, unless the product is that good or the unique offerings are that good, if they don't match that price point that Michigan's kind of set, even in the legal market, um, which has now influenced the illicit market here, I don't know if we're going to see the influx in people. Um, 
because you know a lot of people i feel like especially here in ohio which has always been a uh it's been a pretty neutral state you know i think here even living in cleveland you have you, it's it's like a quarter pound has been decriminalized for several years now um so it's kind of a state where it was easier to get away like doing it illicitly wasn't as big of a crime as it might be in in a southern state or something like that so i'm i'm going to be curious to see how many people even change their buying habits just because it's legal because legality doesn't always mean better which we've learned the hard way through other states you know even going and, and nevada is different now but it's like if you in certain locations but if you go to a planet 13 you're paying 80 dollars an eighth and it's like that versus 120 dollar ounce it isn't even a conversation to a lot of people hold on a second you're telling me uh freaking planet 13 in vegas is charging 80 dollars for an eighth of weed for their top shelf the last time i was there yes which yes. i didn't go this time wow. um I, I didn't, I went and got my medicine elsewhere, but, um, I actually had a funny moment. I was coming down the elevator to go, we we're going to the MJ BizCon and these foreign guys were in there and they're like, where do we get weed, man? And I was like, I don't know where the best place to get weed from, but I will tell you, do not go to planet 13. And they were kind of like, oh, really? That's what everything says. And, and last time I was there, it was a year ago. Like their top shelf was 80 bucks. You know, their edibles were, it's very, tour, you know, it's, it's a tourist trap. Which is it is, like a Ron John surf shop in Florida versus like the large? I mean, it like is a like, it's not even imagine, like a wings. Imagine like 22,000 square feet, but only 500 square feet or a thousand square feet actually has product somewhere. So it's just yeah. like this. Was it like couches and TVs and like no, and no, it. It. they have like a, a, a food area now, like a food court thing that they've been opening. They have like a little thing in the back of it. I thought that they were setting up for maybe sports betting back in the day. And then the actual dispensary showroom itself is, you know, maybe 10,000 square feet or something, but you can definitely, again, 10,000 square feet sounds like a lot, but if there's still only, I don't know, 200 products to choose from, I mean, that's, it's not a lot. It's not a lot of product per square footage size that the place is. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it's, 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 it is, it's like the world's largest gift shop type of thing, but there's only, you know, 80 gifts and the gift shop you can like mission well, impossible roll around the place to each cabinet you know like it, it's like you yeah, can it's take, very you can, visually yeah, like, but i think to dustin's point they are they are they're planning i would think even now that back area is going to end up being a smoke lounge um they're still not there yet in in nevada but um it's definitely going to be like a one-stop shop and have a good time place so uh, I think you're both on the same page as me. Obviously, Ohio is going to have, you know, if they get up by April 20th, which we hope they do, it'd be silly if they don't. But this, this summer, like this summer, this fall is probably going to be a strong sales season for Ohio. But once again, some of these numbers are coming from these other states that are uh, going legal in the market increase. But a state like Missouri, like that, when they go legal, they don't have the already, and I think you, Anthony, brought the best point, the already built-in structure of an alternative option called Michigan, right? Ohioans, and I think this is where Ohio's got their head, the legalization committee and government officials have their head in the sand, is they feel like they're going to go legal and they're going to have adult use and everyone's going to start buying it, but they have to realize they're competitive with Michigan. Right. And it's going to be more expensive than medicinal because it always is with tax. And yep. then so you're going to it's going to be interesting. I think I just everywhere, everybody I talk to, every single person I talk to, and I'm going to pull up a list in a second of some 2024 projections, it says that Ohio is going to be massive. And I think it will have a big jump, but it's going to plateau, I fear, faster than a lot of people than a lot of people think or realize or hope. I hope it doesn't. But I think you have it right, Anthony. It's going to be the pricing. And I think they're going to not, they're going to make, it's going to be too high. And it's going to be too expensive. And cannabis has got to be cheap these well, days. Well, and they got to test the water a little bit. You know, you don't want to come into the 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 game undershooting your, undercutting your price point, And then all of a sudden have to increase it later. It's a hell of a lot easier to decrease yeah. the price later than it is to increase. So if it was me, I'd be starting that shit off at 50 bucks an eighth all the way up. And call it a day and wait till people bitch and then be like, okay, we can do this for 35.
YouTube or something else. But I, I think it, it's a lot harder of a sell. I also think that there's going to be a lot more false predictions based on those four months, those first four months, investment money that's going to come through looking at that first four months going, wow, this market is so viable. And then four months later, after they've spent $2 million, you know, having an issue. Um, we'll see what happens. So uh, back to the article, we're going through this article there. You know, they predicted five states would go legal, Arkansas, Maryland, Missouri, North and South Dakota. Got two of them, right? Uh, Arkansas and Missouri went forward, uh, but the other ones, uh, or, I'm sorry, Maryland and Missouri went forward, but Arkansas, North and South Dakota did not. So two of the ones there. Um, I wanted to take a look at this one, Dustin, uh, because of your favorite word here, a blockchain. Uh, some of their predictions for technology and advancement. It's on my list. I know. Well, this well, let's talk about it. So this guy said in 2023, let's see what um, the managing editor of Niscon Co. Uh, said here. 2023, the cannabis industry is going to start utilizing blockchain technology. Technology is maturing and finally becoming accepted and understood by mainstream culture. Um, no, it's not. I am mainstream culture. I have heard Dustin Kava talk about blockchain for a hundred plus episodes. Do you understand how a credit card works? Understand? I do understand it, but I don't want to. Un you understand how to swipe the fucking I don't want to understand, understand blockchain. the technology. And no, so the, I don't want to know. The point is, is that you shouldn't. What my whole thing is, is that the 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 underlying technology will be fucking used but it's never going to be discussed because it doesn't need to be discussed no one needs to know that you're running your fucking processing or your metric system on blockchain but it's going to be used in the industry because the premise of a smart contract or the premise of how you move assets or information is is it doesn't matter it doesn't fucking matter i don't go to visa and go did my packet for my credit card sale go to 19 servers and get translated into nine databases based on blah 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 it's like fuck no i swiped the card my money came out of my bank that's all people need to know yeah. and so to me that's why blockchain's important because you don't need to fucking come in under your company and say we're utilizing new blockchain technology in our metric system. It, nobody fucking cares. You can say I have ninety nine point nine nine percent accuracy with how the metrics are being stated and stored and sent to the state, and you never need to tell them how the hell it was done. It's it, it's irrelevant, and so it's that it's it's that notion that. Yeah, and people always associate blockchain with asset growth. Oh, the money for Bitcoin dropped 60%. Yeah. How can this be viable? And it's like, you're fucking missing the point. You're just missing the point. Yeah. The technology that made that happen never changed based on what you thought the value of it was. It's And there is an absolute necessity based on this idea that there's only five companies in all of the United States that track and and perform the metrics for their states it's proprietary software it's it's nonsense that doesn't necessarily you can just tell it's that difficult to track from seed to sale and so tools that make that easier only make sense to have within an industry i mean it's it's yeah. so that's why i think blockchain is going to be it's the year of the blockchain in the industry and i think people are trusting the technology mm -hmm before they're trusting the name of the technology because it's being yeah, used for, in their day-to-day -day life anyways just add a quick tag i think the mainstream ruined blockchain because of crypto you know it's like because i i buy cryptocurrencies like stock like i look at it as like if this gets applied to here i have the new amazon or i have the new um whatever so it's like i do think that the mainstream has if anything ruined what blockchain is because everyone thinks it's a that everyone thinks it's a currency and it's like only in like several uh, less than probably 10 or is it actually a current i'm not going to quote that number but bitcoin is really the only mainstream cryptocurrency that has no or blockchain technology that is simply a currency so i well, would agree and with the technology is defined by its usage case and it's a very particular usage case you're not going to have a one to all type of fucking blockchain it's not like this is the internet and you could do a million things on it it is this software is designed to track the movement from seed to sale done it's not designed to transfer wealth when you transact something at a register it's not going to go into that blockchain you want a tool that does exactly one thing but really 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 well and there are many many usage cases in an industry that's highly regulated where you want that one thing 
to be done really well. Whether you have 10 of them and each one does something different is irrelevant. They're all using different software to do their accounting, to track the seat of sale, to process fake ass credit cards that somehow take it out of the bank, but it's not using a bank, but whatever the fuck it is, it needs to do that one thing well. And the industry is finally at that point where they're able to say, we're not just grabbing straws from everywhere, trying to make a business happen. It's we've been in business for five years. We know that this is a failure point in our system and it's taking us 10 times the labor hours to re reconcile our books. What tool can we use to make the books easier to reconcile? It's, it's, it's going to come down to things like that. And we're already seeing it with things like my flora DNA, which we've had on our show, the need to put strain genetics onto a fucking blockchain. That notion of I can upload my genetics to something and it's going to go to every genetic in the database and tell me whether it's a unique genetic or someone else's genetic. And you know, so we're seeing it used in the industry, but it's not, doesn't need to be talked about it. It's a fucking database. It's a version of authenticity. It's a uh, whatever the hell, but yeah, that I'm I glad like you. that theory though. I like the theory of it's something that everyone's going to use, but maybe we should all, or not, we, we should stop talking about it. Like in those folks, you should stop promoting it because to Anthony's point, I do sometimes, and I've listened to Dustin talk about hopefully 2024 is a year. I don't hear blockchain from Dustin. It's already failed already. We're here. <laughs> Uh, I, it's, I still don't always get it. And I do think of it as this kind of transactional thing when it is a very much this inventory driven, like AI. And that's a dirty word I know as well. Uh, do you think cannabis is going to brace AI? Did you get to see a bazillion brands come up with AI created logos in 2024? Do you think it's the year of AI for cannabis and marketing and all that? Is it finally going to be the day? Uh, don't use AI, use Trav Media Group. You can find the link in the description below. <laughs> but outside of Trav Media Group, uh, do you think AI, Anthony, is someone in marketing? Do you think that's going to be a thing where companies try to just do all this shit on their own and have, you know, chat GTP and mid journey and stuff create a forum? Or do you think, uh, marketing agencies are going to find a bigger place to help uh, brands like pop out in 2024. I, again, it's almost the same conversation as blockchain is like AI is just a tool. It's like Trap Media Group will utilize AI um, because we have to evolve. It's like all the agencies I know who are going to evolve are using it. The ones right now who are sitting there going, AI is not real, blah, blah, blah. They ain't going to be in business in the next five or 10 years. Because again, but it's a tool. So do do I think this is going to be the year of AI potentially? Because I think it's it's similar to I guess what happened with crypto is it blew up. Everyone wanted to get involved. Everyone wanted to get their hands clean. And then it's like until it gets past that is when it actually takes form. It's like anyone can use Mid Journey, but I guarantee I'll use Mid not that over anyone, but I would use Mid Journey better than ninety percent of people because I have a hundred hours of training into it. And it, for me, it's just one of my tools in my toolbox. I wouldn't go to every single client and go, here's a, make me a logo for a cannabis company. Here you go. You know, it's only if that tool can fulfill the job. So I see marketing agencies applying it, but I do also see a lot of startup companies using it because to be honest, it's like, you don't have the cost on labor. You do not yeah. have the money to put into a highly specialized X for 150 different hats that the company has to wear. And I also think that BC, you and I have talked about it, AI as a, a greater equalizer for the lowest tier members of a labor pool, mm -hmm. not the highly skilled labor pool. They will increase efficiency from 70% to 90% with AI, but a low level, low labored person can increase from 10% to 70% as a much higher rate or higher growth with that. And so I also think we constantly look at AI as a content delivery tool, a content creation tool, a copywriting, a picture generating, a movie editing tool. But what we're not applying the AI to is all the other facets of the industry that we already hear. Automation of robots to pick and look at your plants, you know, having AI in the lights to look at how the plants are growing and to make minute changes based on the data that it's given. It's not meant to replace a person. It's meant to supplement the person. And when you apply it to 
all these other things, of course, it makes sense. And companies want to automate. They want to be more efficient in how they produce something in the cannabis industry because you have to. How else are you going to make money with 280E around? You need to find efficiencies in other ways. But does it have to be a person looking over with a magnifying glass on every leaf? No, that shit can be done with a fucking camera. Beam it right. down. Or it's having baby. them write like standard operating procedures, having them write codes of conduct, things that yeah. you used to have to sit down and do. You're right. Everyone seems to think, and myself included sometimes, when you use AI, it's typically for content, but it can be greatly used for suggestions for efficiency. Right? Hey, I got this process. It's also something you can train. So like if I can take, because cannabis is social media copy and train something to duplicate that copy very efficiently, couple things there you one to train it to post more often i think marketers i think ai is going to weed out the real content creators and the real marketers because i've worked for marketing agencies that charge absorbent amounts of money for shit it's like you can't afford this even like this podcast you can't afford 2500 bucks a month to have someone do your social media it's not even real life restaurants that i know who have five ten locations struggle to afford that so as a marketer, these tools help me mitigate all these stupid little tasks that the companies need done. And then I can take my money or their money and actually use it for growth. It's like I watch companies pay $15,000 just to send a couple emails a month, even websites. You know, we sell, me and Dustin sell websites. And it's like, I would rather be able to create you a cheaper, faster website. And then you pay me to get people there, to get the content, to get the growth. Yes. So it's, it's going to rather any industry that AI is applied to from creative to like robots, it's going to weed out the bullshit, which or I think maybe is awesome. finally That's create enough efficiency to pay a livable wage. Yes. You know, and up or, a value. What? Yeah. Like, you know, as, as a small yeah. business, it's hard for me to hire someone. It's expensive. And it's like, you know, you're fighting to get to your own level of living that you've sacrificed for so long. So it's like, if these little, like I always say AI is like me having a, a, a small team to literally do exactly what I ask. Like I have never used AI to do something. I guess it does it for me, but like to Dustin's point, it doesn't really create that. Like, sure, you can ask it to create something, but it's going to suck and be generic and you're going to be able to see right through it. But if yeah. you know how to instruct this thing, to do exactly what you want, you know, it's like now I'm just provide because like I almost said this earlier when we were talking about cannabis in Ohio, but I think we're moving into the value market. If you don't provide immense amounts of value, it's not about the thing anymore. It's not about the plant that you're smoking. It's not about the marketing you're doing. It's about what where do I get the most value for my money? You're like inside it's my like soul. AI, I think. What? As a, you're like inside my soul because that's exactly wow. it's 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 what the industry is moving towards. I think. Yeah. The days of saying, bro, I got the dankest, skankest weed ever. So what? Lots of folks do, right? Lots of folks got dank. Lots of folks grow weed. Lots of folks got LED. Lots of folks got hydroponic. Lots of folks got organic soil. Lots of folks got years of experience. At the end of the day, like we always talk, and Dustin and I know from looking at data, it's always a bang for the buck. But I agree with you, Anthony. Everyone's going to be trying to find. Look, there's an article here. Uh, let me bring up this article because it kind of talks about what we're talking about as far as how the industry uh, is moving forward. There's a great article on uh, the website westward.com. Just came out recently about uh, Colorado's first cannabis ghost town. So basically, I'll summarize the article here. Uh, summarize the article here. Um, three years ago, uh, almost 80 farms on this huge giant section of land. Now there's eight eight farms. They're talking about how this guy wants like 1 million for his farm. And he's like, that's never going to happen because there's tons of rundown, abandoned cannabis farms. The price of cannabis in Colorado, which was once at the forefront, the biggest state ever is declining at a rapid pace. In fact, 2023, speaking of 2023 is the first year in the history of cannabis sales that a state went down the first wow. time. That a state went down. Colorado had a negative uh, number as far as total cannabis sales. No states ever had a negative year before. And they no, were the first with but Washington. I do think so Colorado had the cannabis tourism spectrum for the first couple mm, years. That's true. You no, know, so when you're traveling to get your weed into an experience of cannabis, it's one. It's that's a whole nother book. Of, you know, can you know can of worms. Now then, your state has cannabis. Why the fuck should I travel to? To, to Colorado. Now What's Colorado has like uh, every state but Idaho, every state but Idaho in that whole area has legal weed. Like they all do. 
So no Nevada, no, I mean, maybe. And I do believe cannabis tourism is going to be an important draw. I do think there is a market for cannabis tourism, but I think that it's a supplement or an addition to an experience. It's like, it's, I, I will now be looking for Airbnbs that are cannabis friendly. I will be looking for, you know, parks that'll be cannabis friendly or experiences or concerts that are cannabis friendly. But when I travel, but I don't necessarily think I'm going to travel to a place because of cannabis anymore. You know? And I think that why wouldn't it go down? What, how can, how can we have this notion of growth in everything we do that every year is going to be an increase in 5%. It's just not fair or happening right now though. It happens in every industry, especially industries that have publicly public offerings of any kind. You need to, Tell your investors we're going to have eight percent growth this year just to get that money, and it's just it's a it's a highly illogical thing when you think about sometimes the needing to step back to reassess or actualize something new you're working on to get growth down the line. Um, all right, let's switch gears here. The things we're, it's kind of a quick summary of all the things we're talking about. Where it's like now you're being challenged growers are going to be challenged to solve problems. And that seems like, cause it's like, we're talking the dankest weed. It's like the dankest weed doesn't solve my problems. It's like, if I need more energy in the day, them. if I need to feel better, if I need to sleep better, if I need to have more fun, if I need to relax, all of those things are different problems that they're now going to have to solve. Because I'll tell you what, if I could, if it was between a hundred dollar ounce and a $50 eighth, but that $50 eighth is going to focus me and get me my job done better. And increase my productivity i'll buy it because it does it fulfills a value that is higher to me than just getting stoned um all right let's take this let's do a slight switch in the conversation here uh because i know we got some other stuff we want to talk about as far as 2024 uh hopefully it's not all doom and gloom let's talk about some fun stuff uh some products that we like to consume real quick though maybe a bit doom and gloom uh we have seen uh for example i can tell you dustin when i started the cleveland school of cannabis the percentage of flowers sold across the country was 64 percent as far as what the marketplace is uh the 2023 numbers aren't quite out yet but in 2022 uh the Flour, we're talking just flour across uh, all dispensaries was in the mid 30s, high 40s, depends on where you're at. So we'll say, let's say 40% to average it out. So in just six years, 24% of sales have transformed from flour to all the different produced and extracted products. Uh, Is this the year that we see uh, flour drop below 30%? And if so, from both of you, we'll start with Dustin and go to Anthony. Uh, what are some of the cool topics or what are those other products outside of flour you think are going to see uh, their day in the sun or you think are going to be a marketplace to replace flour? Flour goes down and pre-rolls is a interesting part because that goes up. But as flour goes down, what do you think replaces it? What do you think the uh, people are going to want in 2024? What's going to be popular? I, I keep thinking back to the conversation with Patrick Grainier from uh, pre-roller, which I fucking love that dude. He's one of the most approachable guys in the industry. That was a and really probably- fun episode. He's, I- he was straight from Canada. We had a great conversation. Who would have thought we had a great conversation about a quarter million dollar rolling machines, but it was and awesome. And you were, you know, in that, in that episode, I really pushed hard against the death of flower. And he looked at me and was like, you're fucking crazy, man. Pre-rolls are always going to be in. I don't care who you are or what you're doing in every market. Pre-rolls have an absolutely phenomenal market share period, especially in places with tourism. And I wondered, you know, I, I, I keep trying to see it in his light in that regard. And I would say every other month I jump back and forth. Is this really the death of flower or nah, man, flower is always going to be around. I, I honestly don't know, but I do know that there are some products and we'll get Anthony's view on this first before I just think about some of the products that I think are going to really- All right, death of flower, Anthony, is it going to happen as flower? I mean, flower is always existing. It's not going away, but is it mm-hmm. going to see its trage- continual decline? I unfortunately think so. I'm a big flower guy, but I'm a a legacy cannabis consumer. So like, I think, at, you know, I come from flower and consuming flower. I do agree with pre-rolls because I love, I think I even travel and will go. That's usually what I will buy is like a pre-roll to try different things, even though it's not always the best 
um, flour. It's like getting a flight, but, but it is, it gets you a similar taste. It's quick and convenient. And if you don't want to, if you got to drop it and roll, it's a couple bucks. Like it doesn't feel as yeah. bad, like the commitment to let it go, but it also gets you that immediate controlled satisfaction that you can't always get from an oil cartridge or uh, edible for sure. I also like to smoke. Um, like I used to smoke cigarettes yeah, for, yeah. you know, it's been 10 years, I think almost since I've quit smoking cigarettes, but I love smoking. I also love in the, in the pre-roll world, the little half gram dog walkers. Oh, we're mm. big fans of them. Shout the out to the point fivers. Yeah, right on. Those I would buy all day. When I was last all in Canada, day, that's what day. I bought because I got like 10 of them for like 25 bucks or something really affordable. And it's like the perfect little pull it out. You could share it with even one person and you're, cause that's the thing I've been trying to think about a lot in my own consumption is overuse. Like I'm a joint smoker. So it's like, you don't need all that. Like you will get the same effects from a, a bowl. So I, I but I, I guess back to the original question, um, I do think it's going to go down, but I'm not sure it's, in, I, Dustin, let's throw it back to you, but it's like, I don't know exactly what I think, I think will replace. There's a convenience factor with usage now. Now that there is an option for convenience or lack of smell when you have children around or very specific dosing requirements, and I do think that the healthy, I, the newer generation is statistically more focused on more healthy habits, period. Mm -hmm. And so with that, the lack of inhalation makes sense why that would be on a rise. And if you have a fucking pie of 100%, something's got to give to increase the numbers in some other new thing that's coming out. And they'll think to have the highest or the biggest placement of that pie share get removed, of course, is flour. It makes complete sense. Anthony brought up a great point that it's legacy use breeds legacy familiarity and want to use the same thing that they've always been familiar with. The newer generation saying, no, a cartridge that my, that my mom or my kids or my boss won't necessarily smell that's what I started on. That's what I initially started using. Of course, I'm going to fucking keep using that. And there's a reason we're for creating a new legacy consumer. Like you yeah. are, I don't know if yeah. I've really wrapped my head around that, but now that you're both are saying it, the new legacy consumer, like we all, we all started when we were younger, maybe before legal age, whatever, having a joint. It was all flour. You, you didn't have anything. No one was like, hey, here's a, here's a cannabis beverage in a can. Let's sneak out behind the shed. You had beers, but you didn't have like, Hey, here's a crazy peanut butter truffle filled with can like you got weed and you smoked flour. And so now consumers, especially younger consumers who are sampling and even of legal age, it probably starts a lot with carts and you're going to see, I mean, it makes sense now we're creating a new legacy. <sighs> yeah. And we're destroying a lot of legacy businesses in the <laughs> process. Like, yeah. Coming from the head shop game, nobody is fucking smoking from bongs anymore. My my heart breaks on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> realizing that my kids will probably never smack, but smack back an old five footer that I used oh, to yeah, spank no when I was younger, you know? And that's a hard thing. There are, there's a lot of like people who I really genuinely care about that are out of business because of the new spectrum of, of usage. And it's just the way it is. There's always going to be growth and there's always going to be change in some way. I just didn't think it was going to happen as fucking fast as it did, which is just incredible. Um, thinking What's about the new hotness. What do you like coming out this year then? Fast acting edibles. Fast Man, acting. Our boy over at iBliss just Nate changed, Nate Zeke changed my whole perception of how social lounges can function, where growth could be for a concert venue or something else. Uh, 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 and fast acting edibles, that two minute activation time for five milligram and high absorption rates, I think are going to be. This is going to be the year for them. This is All where right. they're really going to to be able to, to prove that their their usage case. If sure. it costs like $15 for a 12 ounce beer, which <laughs> is, you know, like $10 for a six pack, maybe at a concert, how much do you think a five milligram, five milligram shot is going to cost? It's the same concert? thing. I think it's genuinely, they can, they can market it along that same level because your experience and the effect and the, how long lasting it does is the same as what yeah, the shorter burst of highs. Yeah. And I also think that it's in such a smaller burst that you can step yourself up and just like a guy at a concert buying three beers at $50 now for his night 
it's no different. It's 50 bucks. It's it's he's going to hit his smack back his five shots of THC. Um, but it, that experience of knowing where you're at after you drink it within minutes, not an hour and a half now allows you to cater to your environment and to the experience you want to have. There's yeah, no I'll more going to be. Yeah, go on. I'll stuck at that. Cause I I'll shout out a brand that I just met and I didn't meet them. I met their production team and I love them. It was called Tejas tonics out of um, Texas. Mm. And it is a, about a tall boy, not a tall, it's like 16 ounce or probably um, of it's a, a lime tonic definitely has a cannabis taste, but it's five milligrams of THC and so much CBD. I, I can't remember CBD, the exact, yeah. I thought it was one. equal, like almost like a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, think um I'm, i apologize if i'm misquoting the product i don't think they were fast acting but i was consuming those i got them at the the dr bridget william party um there they are those are my favorite thing ever like if i didn't live in ohio you can order them it says but i'm not sure how that works i don't know if that's i don't think you can thing, get them sent to ohio but it's interesting we can talk about this anthony because i know this is something that you're maybe a little concerned might get too confusing but uh we have and i don't think it's fast acting but yeah the heavy cbd heavy terp content they're playing yeah. the sneaky game with it as far as saying look we know and this is how people get creative we know that we can actually like up the terp content and create euphoric sensations yeah. with having a lower THC content that probably fits within many of the legal cannabinoid rules. So I don't know if there's a lot of state to state exportation, but these things here you say felt good, but also even with that low THC, you probably felt um, a sensation that they were kind of going yeah, they, for. Hoping they for. hit because at the part when I got them originally, um, I only drank one of them, but the guy gave, I was raving about them. So he gave me some and I drank them. Um, on the day up into the airport and I probably had like two or three and I felt I slept on the plane real well. I felt it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, <clears throat> intoxicating in the way of like alcohol or anything. But what I loved about them is like, I, I, I drink, but I, I almost drink cause I like to consume a beverage. Like if I'm at a social event or I'm out or I'm with friends, it's like you get, I just want to sip a like drink a beer and then you end up getting drunk. It's like those things like completely, pacified that like desire to sip something and you drink them slow enough because of the carbonation and everything where it's like you know that's that's not that's the five milli it's almost like a beer versus shot you know exactly what it yeah. is but uh i loved absolutely love those and i'm really excited <clears throat> that i guess is what i'm excited about i hope in ohio is that i can cruise up to the dispensary and get me a six pack of those and sip on those at home um or any kind of brand like that but uh, I totally agree. I just, you had fast take... acting to that and kind of move it around. It's a winner. I just and... had my first cannabis beverage recently. Uh, well, shout out Wellspring Fields here in Ohio. I had my yeah. first cannabis medicinal beverage, 50 milligram, 12 ounce can, sparkling water. It, it was a good, it packed a punch. <laughs> I mean, for yeah, that, yeah. So it was definitely a little more than I wanted. Uh, yeah, it was a lie to actually have to be 100% recyclable, which is not happening in the cannabis industry to be able to recycle the aluminum can and, and Yo, make yeah, it into great. something else or do it. That is a huge problem in this country with cannabis, the waste and packaging. And yeah, aluminum cans have an extremely high recyclable rate. So I don't know, man, there's 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 something to the need sometimes to shift over to a product like that as an industry. Uh, but you are paying you're paying the damn premium, too, for a drink. And I feel like I'm paying three times the amount of money for water for the water that's in the can than I am for the amount of THC. No, you're milk. paying for the, actually probably the canning process and for the 17 employees who work on the, uh, you know, Laverne and Shirley who are working on the assembly line, <laughs> uh, kind of go, I mean, you're paying for all that when you have the beverage, unfortunately, but it's like any service, right? It's like the pre-roll, it's a pre-roll. It's the same, there's no difference other than you're probably getting more THC for your dollar in the pre-roll, but it's that same concept. It's a service industry doing something you can't or won't do and then charging you a more because we made it into this. You know what I need now that I think about it? Uh, let's brainstorm. I have a soda stream. Can I get like a tincture and make my own? Yes. Hold, yes. hold, yes. hold on a second, gentlemen. I just had a total explosion. I could make my own infused beverages in the soda stream. Need Not some simple that. syrup. Some infused yeah. simple syrup. I've already looked into this because I, I, like, I, I'm such a fan of the product. But you need some simple syrup. Um, and if you infuse the simple, get some infused simple syrup, you can just measure that out and add it into a soda stream lime. And I'm sure it's not 
the taste might be not dialed in. You're missing the terpenes and stuff, but you know, you can make a, but even a cocktail, you know, use that as you replace simple syrup with that. And it's like, now you have a, a pineapple soda with a lime and some THC instead of alcohol, which I think is, I think we need less alcohol in our country. <laughs> so uh, I'm well, all maybe not right now. Uh, why, why aren't people making the chicken pot pies of THC? I'm so tired of the sweet, sugary, carbonated yeah. thing. I wish I just want some down home fucking barbecued chicken Dude. or something, you know? Like, one of my favorite to see that. Real quick, one of my favorite edible experiences was there's a company in Vegas. Like, this is the last thing I ever bought from Planet 13. Was it was a uh, it was a uh, Cajun uh, wing rub that were packeted out into like 10 milligrams and you would just shake them on wings and they were not only delicious and savory, but they pat like the, the buzz was a decent one, you know? <laughs> so you eat, like, you eat like, you eat like a, you shake like 20 milligrams on a, a dozen chicken wings and it's like, boom, you're done. That's a bizarre experience that I can't even wrap my head around. I'm trying to uh, figure out how that's happening in my brain. Did you see any other cool brands? You got any like cool celebrity brands or anything, Anthony, that's coming out this year that you uh, are excited about? Coming out this year. Um, I haven't seen anything I'm super excited about. I did have a predict. I don't, I don't want to de derail the episode in our predictions, but I do have a fun prediction on someone I could see entering the space, but at MJ this year, it seemed a lot of the same, you know, Tyson, um is still holding ground hulk hogan just entered the c i don't know if he entered thc but he just entered the cbd kratom space and which i mushrooms. think is like Ric flair get into that yeah. the mushrooms that's who it is i got my can behind me somewhere in this room. yeah you got the rick flair energy drink yeah he's in it um but i i think i that's, that's one of where my prediction comes in is there's a there's a a wonderful branding company that works with a, a lot of those gentlemen um and i think I think we could see more of that. You know, there are, um, who did I read was in the space that I was surprised, but I, I didn't see anyone new this year out at MJ or anything that, that like caught my eye. It's going to, I mean, I think you're going to see this year as you get more States go legal, obviously, I think you're going to get more and more comfortability with celebrities. And then athletes is the other big part of that is almost every major professional sports league, the NBA, and even now the NFL relaxes drug testing rules. You don't see a many active players out there though. I think you'll start to see CBD products, uh, but what you are seeing is a lot of former athletes, a lot of, you know, celebrities getting into it. So I think you're going to continue to see, uh, that celebrity brand uh, kind of push forward uh, as we go forward next year. I think we'll see. It'll be interesting. Um, I'm a big fan, Dustin. You know this. I think, as you talked about, any way to consume the plant that maybe doesn't uh, have adverse health reactions. So uh, capsules and nebulizers. I think both of those are going to be very big. I think, you know, we love our fascination with the nebulization of it. No combustion whatsoever. Uh, capsules are the low key way to go with edibles. Don't pay for the sugars and the packaging and all that. Just pay for push smushed product in a vegetable cap. That's all you need, sir. Uh, so I think you're right. You're going to continue to see uh, the rise of that. All right. One more thing I want to talk about here before we get going uh, for that. Uh, well, two kind of, I guess, big points. We'll we'll finish with our big projection of what we think will happen with cannabis as a country uh, before we end the show. But I know, Anthony, uh, you were talking a little bit before we went on about, you know, like we, in, same with that cactus uh, with the can we just brought up, using a heavy, heavy terp content. Um, I feel like, I feel like every time I go to a cannabis conference and every time I talk to a cannabis person, a person who works in the industry, they go through and talk to me all about all the terps and the profiles and the, the terp solids you can make to get all these things. Then I haven't done this recently. I have a conversation with an everyday Joe or Jane who's just walking in the door and I'm like, Hey, you want to hear all about this terp profile? And they're like, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand what all these terps mean. I don't know why you're trying to educate me, but in the industry, we're always trying to educate on terps and educate on all these different things. And, uh, do you feel like that is like this thing that is hurting the industry should in 2024, should we, I don't want to say dumb down, simplify how we market cannabis. Should we stop with the terpene shit? I know it's important. Should we leave that to the super nerds? Like, how do you feel as we go forth, both terps, cannabinoids, you know, we're getting more CBGA and CBDN. We got to always explain. And every time, every time you talk to someone about what's the most important thing, education. 
which I find to be patooey. I say, don't educate them, sell them weed. Like, do you want to teach them or do you want to sell them weed, right? <laughs> uh, how do you think when it comes to marketing, where's that line? What should companies do to educate versus just sell them the product on emotion versus all the science? Oh, it's so much science. Um, I mean, I got kind of two parts to that. Um, one is that I don't think education is 100% necessary for sale. Um, I believe in being an educated consumer. I believe I love educating people on cannabis, but you know, you don't know how a lot of things work and how they're made and what the value of, you know, how they flavor soda and all these different things like those don't come into play. So I think they're, I think as a brand, you don't, Oh, it's easy to approach cannabis marketing and go, well, we're just going to educate people. And it's like that not is not always the right way. If you look at cookies, um, I'm not going to go as far as the quote that they don't do any education, but cookies is a lifestyle brand and they focus they're on marketing. very light, very they're, light on education. They're well, that's and they're huge. They're the one of they're the one of the biggest brands as far as equity of a name in the space. You know, cookies when you go when you go anywhere, you, I see it. And I was just at a, a mall here doing Christmas shopping and they're selling cookies merch, you know. Um, so I don't think that's necessary, but to go back on the terpenes, I think if you are educating now is the time to further educate on terpenes. Cause one thing I did see at MJ BizCon this year, and I wrote it on our notes as the great terpene confusion, <laughs> there are products now that are similar to like Bovida, um, and things of that nature where they're trying to infuse old bud with terpenes, which immediately was like. That's not how it works. You know, essentially they're trying to add fictitious smell to, sh to bad weed or to old weed. Now, some of these companies oh, goal like is to spray it to like, just make it smell. It's and taste in the, I wish I had them. I'm not at my office, but they're like bo Bovida bags that have limonene in them. So you put it in your jar and it makes the jar stink. It's so potent that people were using oregano as an example. And they would what? show me a jar of oregano joints that have it in it. And it would smell like limes. Some companies are approaching it as a way to custom formulate these terpene profiles to re-enhance old cannabis, which I don't think is entirely stupid because if you're a grower or a small business and you're sitting on a bunch of shit that's old, I don't think infusing it with the proper portfolio may be a bad thing if it's advertised that way. But it's for someone just like, oh, you want to infuse your granddaddy perp with some lime and eat? Like it, or it's like none of that even makes sense. And it's like now you're eliminating... Now terpenes are becoming smell, which is a part of it, but you're missing, like we just talked about the, the met, the, what it's actually doing to the product. So I think now terpene is going to be a word that is going to get some, like synced up with the smell and people are going to start going, Oh, well, I want it to smell like blueberries and I want it to smell like this. And I want it to smell like that. And it's like, you don't even know what you, you're just, you're just adding fake smell to your cannabis. You are not talking terpenes. You are not doing anything. So I, I'm going to dub it the great terpene confusion, but I saw several, I saw several companies doing this this year. And I, in poor sales guys, I was just, I was kind of just giving them shit. But yeah, I was like, is. so explain like what you're actually doing here. And they're like, oh, we're infusing the cannabis with terpenes. I'm like, mm, uh, no. Make yeah, you sad? It's, it's one of these, well, I don't know, because I do think that high THC content products are still going to be king. And if you're doing everything right, you can't have high percentage THC and enough space and room in the plant for the terpenes. So it makes sense to why you would want to grow for 30%, but then reintroduce some type of terpene profile into the product. But again, when you start getting into things like that, then you go back into synthetic terpenes and you go back into these, there's always going to be a cheaper spectrum of doing what you're doing. And that ends up being the most common across the board. And so I am scared that there isn't enough education on terpenes to begin with, but that the education that people know that is out there is going to in adverse affect them in a different way because because of the way they're talking about it because they are they're thinking about it as a smell or specific taste but not exactly getting it right not explaining why we should have done this to begin with and just grown a lower thc product and have it still be just as profitable i think that we're we're just there's too much in-house fighting and too much money to be made in high percentage cannabis 
It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fun year. I think it's going to be a fun year. Uh, we've had a really good conversation. We're kind of over a limit of an hour, but I want to keep going here for a few minutes because I want to bring this up uh, and then we'll uh, kind of wrap up the show here. Our good buddy, uh, Dustin Anthony, Andrew D'Angelo. Uh, you can check out multiple interviews we've had with him. The Budding Minds with Andrew D'Angelo, episode one available now, episode two coming soon. Right now, subscribe to the channel, get those notifications. He wrote an article for Forbes.com. And I wanted to run by his predictions, right? Someone who knows a lot about the industry and get your uh, thoughts on them as well. So uh, both cannabis and psychedelics. And I should say, we didn't get to this yet, but I think 2024 is going to be the year of shrooms. And I don't just mean necessarily psychedelic shrooms, but shrooms, and they've been rising and rising, but where it's starting to be in every soft drink, every kind of thing, like all the health mushroom things is really going to become, I think, a lot more accepted into this year. Uh, so let's start with his number one thing, um, and I guess kind of your opinions here. We got right now, he does not think the DEA is going to reschedule uh, cannabis to Category 3, which basically implies no federal legalization in 2024. Uh, before we continue out with the rest of this, uh, Anthony, are we going to have legal weed as a country this year? I, I don't think legal weed, but I think rescheduling cannabis Ooh. is going to happen. Um, and my reason is it's an election year. I, so I think like, you know, the, the Democrats specifically always try to favor these kind of issues. I think every election cycle we hear about promising of legalization. Now, Joe Biden has done a lot with um, letting people out of jail and stuff, which has been nice. But I don't think I think that's one thing that party under delivers on specifically. Um, so I think I think we will see it and also not. I'm not super plugged into what's going on in politics, but I know DeSantis is running on the other side and he just came out and said he completely advocates states' rights. So I think even a case could be made on that side that descheduling it gives more power to the states. Um, so I don't think we're going to see federal legalization, but I do think descheduling it is going to happen. Uh, Dustin, you're wrong. Every time we talked about Ohio until it went legal, what do you think about the country this year? Well, yeah. So I'm, if I was an investor, I'd fucking do whatever the opposite of what I say. So, uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I don't think that there's enough need to get the votes or that the votes would help in such an exorbitant amount of way to sway one thing or another. And so I don't think it's necessarily as important as, uh, as uh, we, as I, as I think, I just, I think that, if it would, it wouldn't be done this year during the election. It'd be done in the pretense of if I get elected, here are my next year's goals. Yeah. Here's my next term goals. And I, I mean, the slower that they get, the more money that the IRS collects. And so I don't know. There's just there's, there's just not a lot of reason to deschedule it other than our fucking jails are absolutely filled with fucking non- which is a pretty good reason if we're yeah. being honest, but yeah, I agree with you on a money too. I just, I don't know. All right. Speaking of Anthony, you mentioned Ron DeSantis having state rights. Uh, number two on uh, Andrew D'Angelo's list at Forbes.com. You can find the article in the comments below. Uh, Florida will not legalize adult use cannabis. You want to talk about a state that you just talked about, Dustin, like, why do we need to legalize adult use? We already do a billion in medicinal cannabis. Like, Everyone smoking weed in Florida, they all got their cards. They really don't care. Why does DeSantis need to legalize adult use? It's been in probably, I mean, it's predicted that Florida would be one of the top five states in cannabis if it went legal. Uh, do you see Florida with DeSantis making a push to legalize it? Uh, either one of you. Um, as much as I want to say yes, probably not. Um, I know it's been on the ballot there for a while. I actually plan on... Um, opening up another location for trap media group and locating myself to Florida. So I hope it goes right. You might be the cool. deciding vote, Anthony. Yeah. I can't I believe you're about to move. Kyle finally gonna, goes legal. You're like, maybe both. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving all this legal. If, they can, if they can get some sunshine and cannabis here in Ohio, I'll stay. Well, but, it's pretty uh, easy to get a uh, card down there. For, uh, for sure. For that. And it's, so, it's, um, it's, uh, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I agree that it, I don't think it will happen this year, but I do agree that, Florida is going to be the next, you know, I think Miami will be the next big place for cannabis once it legalizes. Oh, I'd be so partying down there. 
Uh, number three on the list, Dustin, is Ohio going to be the biggest cannabis market story of 2024? Is all the pundits, are we going to get article after article after article like that ghost town one? Is everyone going to be talking about Ohio cannabis? We obviously, you can miss the first part of the show. You can go check it out. Uh, is everybody going to be talking about cannabis in Ohio in 2024 on a national level? I don't know, man. I fucking Andrew have, think so. I, I've think been to, I don't know, 150 dispensaries across maybe seven states or something like that. And I have, I have always consistently been impressed with Ohio's cannabis outside of the cost of it and how bullshit our tenths are and, and, and the way we sell our oil and all this other shit. I do think that Ohio growers are fucking awesome. Oh, and I got so some straight fire downstairs. There's some, there's some stuff that I think that because of that, that to me is something that has, that is building a foundation to grow off of when your cannabis is actually good and it's not just plentiful, it's actually good and semi plentiful. Um, I think there is, that's a good foundation for growth. Will it be the headlines? Maybe. I mean, we're always that swing state when it comes to changing ideologies or setting the tone for certain things. Uh, but there's such a push against the way we're setting the tone today with issue two that I don't know. I just, I, I can't say it any one way or another. I think I just don't know. I, but again, I think D'Angelo has an amazing, he works with enough clients in Ohio and has worked with enough clients in the rest of the country to see the small glimmers of hope in pockets where Ohio could have explosion, explosive growth and, and media presence for that. He's a bit noncommittal on New York here is number four, talking about how New York could explode both good and bad, but I want to get your opinion, Anthony, at number five here. Uh, we see a lot of states, including Ohio, continue to crack down on the hemp-derived cannabinoids. We've talked ad nauseum on the show about my love of CBG and such. Uh, how do you think, as we continue to push, more states go legal, uh, states cracking down, cultivator, uh, cultivator driven, by the way, it does them no good to have uh, cheap D8 products available in every head shop in the area. Do you think hemp derived is going to continue to grow and become a bigger thing? CBD, CBG, other cannabinoids we don't know yet. Similarly, I guess with the Terps, that's in that same mold. Is that going to grow or do you think THC is going to kind of, more states will regulate it and it'll be harder and harder to be this non-THC business in states? Um, I think it will continue to grow this year, but I do think it's a bubble. Um, and I don't know when that bubble is going to pop because the unfortunate thing is like, I think there's a healthy conversation about CBD and like, I think there's people who should smoke CBD and not smoke the THC weed. But I also don't think Delta eight is the, is the truth. I also, you know, I, even that MJ, I saw a lot of people selling like hemp derived Delta nine but it wasn't Delta nine and it's four. they're selling 4,000 milligram gummies. And just like, it's going to end up being, um, it's going to end up being just like that sleazy kind of like, not what I think it was K2, but whatever the synthetic cannabis was like 15 years ago or 10 years ago when I was 18. Um, it's the same thing there. It's not going to, it's the problem is out. like CBD starts to get shoved into the same window is the hemp derived D9. And it's really not. We know this. But I think on a regulatory level, from a big picture, I'm a government official. I just know the very, very highlights of legal weed. You put CBD or CBG, which straight CBG, I think, once again, more people should be smoking yeah. that than heavy yeah. sativa, high THC. You want a good upper, just do straight CBG. You don't need that 30% sativa. Shout out Reverb Wellness. Yeah, Reverb Wellness is yeah. a great white flower CBG. Delicious, so, yeah. But I think it gets sho those type of cannabinoids get shoved into there with the hemp derived. I was just with someone yesterday. He was like, look at this weed I got. And I was like, oh my God, this looks straight from China, right? Not good stuff, right? It was not good. So uh, I do agree. I think that bubble is going to finally pop uh, there. Speaking of which, um, MDMA, psilocybin, things like that. Uh, do you think there's a chance that MDMA, psilocybin, and maybe some other psychedelics get rescheduled, either one of you, before cannabis gets rescheduled? Ah, maybe. It's such right? a hard thing. I don't know why MDMA is associated. I, I, I do not associate your fucking ecstasy and your your shrooms in the same uh, boat uh, as the uh, same I schedule. I think it's because on a – on. I and mean, I've heard a lot of, I mean, listen to podcasts and whatnot. I'm not educated as much as some of these other folks, but I think in very low doses, you use MDMA 
And it's similarly to that ayahuasca DMT. It had a hundred percent effective rate in, in, in couples therapy sessions, a hundred percent. Like oh, yeah, in a couple. High shit on ecstasy. Yeah, of course they're, they're loving each other. About, no one like, loves each I other more than that. I understand you and we're fucking on the same page finally. And so, and I do think with veteran trauma and PTSD, but I'm surprised that we saw the explosion in ketamine use before MDMA and 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 true. I mean, they talk about it on a regular basis. There's just a headline today. Pete Davidson was high in ketamine when he met the president. And Elon like, Musk is doing it, ketamine right now, and yeah, should it, we stop him from running his all company? The, I don't know. Well, even the, the, having the ketamine Perry. clinics, we had the OD of ketamine. Yeah, I don't. I mean, like, I I'm very surprised that some of this shit is happening before cannabis, especially when no one's. I mean, the the amount of fear behind using or smoking a joint to shrooms or fucking ecstasy or ketamine they're just they're on such another level of psycho stimulants psych, you know psychotherapy drugs they're in a whole nother fucking bucket and we keep kind of putting them in the same bucket that we do with cannabis and it's it's, it's a very strange paradigm we're in i'm uh, always Anthony. surprised if you were to sit down with someone who's like, hey, buddy, I'm going to start my own marketing company, would you advise them to start in cannabis or in number eight here, as Andrew predicts, that the psychedelic media space, the psychedelic content space is going to explode in 2024? Would you advise someone to focus more heavily on, say, psychedelic marketing and knowledge or cannabis, which do you think, as of right now, putting your feet on the fire, has a better maybe financial potential or bigger room for growth in the next four or five years, psychedelic centric cannabis or media or cannabis centric media. And there's obviously bleed over, but which would you think about going into if you had to start today and you're like 20 years old? If you're th I mean, if you're thinking pure profit cannabis, um, I went into cannabis cause I love it. You know, I don't have, I have all respect for psychedelics, but that is not my passion. Like I don't, I don't believe as strongly in them as some people do, but what, but I have plenty of good friends who that's what's helped them. And that's, what's done. It, and I totally support that. But I think cannabis is, would be the way to go. And I would all, but also on the flip side, if you're a content creator, I think the psychedelic space is wide open. I think cannabis wide is, open. is harder to break into right now because there's shows like this. There's a lot of, Hell yeah, people. there is damn right. And there's it's getting lot, boring. There's a lot of people doing it. There is something to when you hear something over and over and over again, you're just like, I don't give a fuck anymore. I think it's uh, I also, uh, uh, just go also ahead. to bring up one story to, to give some evidence. This, I was going to say this for number seven, too. And Dustin was actually in the room when this happened. We sat there um, in Andrew's house. What was it, 2017 or 2018? And we all sat there and we're like, man, we missed the bus. Like, cannabis is gone. We, we, we failed. And now sitting here five, six, seven years later... The bus hasn't even left the station. So mm -hmm. when it comes to psychedelics, I don't think we're going to be seeing any major movement in psychedelics for decades. And I, I'm great... only saying that because cannabis isn't even there. I'll probably be fucking 50, 60 years old before cannabis is really a full fledged ecosystem. You know, it's like now even marketing cannabis, like I ain't, you know, there's money, but it's like, I'm not sitting here in my mansion you know, if you want to make money, go market something else. It's like, cause there's no ad revenue here. Well, I can't I, make money off ads. There's no nothing. And I do think that the, 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 the pocket of psychic, the, the pocket of, of mind altering substances that have the potential to make the most amount of money per usage case is your shrooms, is your MDMA, is your ketamine. I mean, they're charging $500 for uh, the tiniest little amount of ketamine that you could probably bribe a veterinarian clinic the same amount of money and get two years <laughs> worth of fucking ketamine for yeah. them. You know, and, do and not do that. it's just this notion that because it's a doctor handing you it and you're having a curated process throughout that session with it, it's still $500 for five milligrams of it or whatever the fuck. Like, I don't think I realized it was that expensive. It's an exorbitant amount of money. I had no idea. Thousands and thousands of dollars for a full treatment session. Yeah. It's almost like you're buying a, a year and a half's worth of fucking Rick Simpson oil for two sessions, you know? So I, I, again, it's if your insurance pays for it and psychedelics have the 
placement to where a physician is almost absolutely required to facilitate it. Whereas yes. cannabis doesn't have that, doesn't have that need. And so, yes, I do think that there's a shit ton more money. And when you're paying your doctors a certain salary, yeah, I think that, and without 280E, now if they apply 280E to psychedelics and MDMA and ketamine, which it's not, what's the, what's the point when you can't, you're not at, there's no money in it. The minute 280 yeah. is still around, there's no money in the industry, period. It will be interesting. It's going to be a fun year. I mean, I think it's going to be a fun year. It's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens. But I got to tell you two things uh, to kind of put a pin in this conversation. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Anthony. I think it's here. Like there is a burgeoning psychedelic media space. There's some things, but it is it's going to be several more years, several more years before it gets even close to cannabis. Cause you said cannabis. And I think the problem is cannabis to some folks, cause they've been doing it since way back in 2014 feels like they've lived in cannabis times move fast. We know the cannabis calendar moves quicker than real life. So we can feel like cat years, like you've lived and worked for 40 years when it's only been like four or five years, but it's still, it's still going. We're still at the tip of the iceberg. It's still, uh, and even Andrew's last point in that article was the suits and the roots are still in conflict. It's still illegal in all these states. We still have states like Ohio, which have all these other states around it that they could legalize and be like, oh, this works really well. They're still like, no, we want to put this here and we want these percentages. And it, it's so not even close, not even close to mainstream acceptance. We're just in this nice cannabis uh, cloud, so to speak, in the area. Uh, I'm going to trademark that for my bubble conversation the cannabis cloud folks uh we were in this cannabis cloud there for a moment so i think it will be interesting to see but i think we're a long ways away i think we're a long ways away from like psychedelics being so comfortable and the other part to you dustin is it to do it right a the chance of doing too much and having a terrible experience is so high it's such a, like, yeah. we've all had a bad edible trip, you eat hundred milligrams. You're like, bro, I shouldn't have done that. But the next day you're probably not having like a psychotic break unless you had one of my brownies. That may have happened. I've heard a story, uh, but Perfect. sometimes oh, you can, of bad too. Yeah. You like you like, can you're, damage. You're pulling the wires and it's like, if you, yeah, that's, wire, <laughs> that's a great thing. Yeah, I don't want to be pulling wires. So you got to have this guide. So it creates uh, a level of spot. And then I did not realize till just now the price point, I was not okay, even here's the, here's what I'm reading. Average cost is between $400 and $2,000 per infusion. And in some places, it can, depending on what you're, you're, you're uh, treating, whether it's depression or something, that cost could go up or down. And you could do, for a full treatment, anywhere between four and six treatments over one to three weeks. So, you know, whatever that breaks down to, it's $200 a session all the way up to $600 a session for multiple weeks. And what the fuck? That's a lot of money. That's an entire year's worth of cannabis sales in two weeks. Yeah, no, you're right. I didn't realize so, as much. I mean, that's I want to start a, ke a ketamine clinic. <laughs> I mean, that's going to slow the, the opening up down anyway, because why? It's like selling Coke for selling weed in the 80s. It's like, why are you going to want to? Why are you going to want to do, why are you going to want to lower your price point? It's like, you're barely paying for product you're supplying, but it kind of gets like, even to tie it back earlier, it's like, that's that value. It's like, you're paying for the facility and the nurse and the, the safety and all those things that, you know, I think that's, what's going to have to happen with psychedelics. No, I don't know. I'm excited to see what happens. We'll, we'll have to do this. We'll uh, meet each other back here uh, late December of 2024. We'll see how right or wrong we were uh, it. when it comes to guesses. Uh, thank you, everyone. Let's say goodbye to Anthony. Anthony Trav, Trav Media Group. You're going to find uh, links to uh, what he's got going on below. If you are a company that is looking to uh, take the next step, if you're a company that's looking to get some fresh creative ideas, clearly you heard those coming out through the show, hit up Anthony Trav and Trav Media Group using that link. Anthony, thank you for joining us as always. We know we'll see you back on the show. The show show soon uh take care all right dustin uh it's me and you a new year 100 plus shows uh if we do our math right you know we'll get another 50 or so in this year we'll be cranking 150 by the end of this uh season i'm excited i'm looking forward to seeing what 2024 brings uh we ended strong in december of 2023 <laughs> check out the leafly episode check out the jim belushi episode great year the biggest year we've month we've had so far um because cannabis thank you each and every one of you that subscribed, that hit the notification button, that followed us on Spotify. Uh, thank you for checking us out. Uh, Dustin, I'll see you next week, sir. <laughs> yeah, later, brother. It's good talking. <laughs>